Good morning, everyone. I do have some pretty big updates to start off. The wheels are turning on the farm as they always are this time of year. Spring is definitely approaching. Although we're working on winter stuff, we're also looking into planting season already. The major news is that this weekend, we had our first egg laid in the chicken coop, which is exciting. That was kind of a half truth because one of these ladies laid it outside of the chicken coop in the run. So we'll work on that. Allie's definitely excited because she's been looking forward to some eggs and now they're starting to show up. We got to get started on our work. We're kind of entering a fake spring after a really harsh couple weeks of a true winter. It's going to be in the 50s to 60s here for the next couple of weeks, which is unusual for February, although not impossible. So I'm guesstimating that in another couple weeks, it's probably going to cool way back down. We'll get a little more of our soft ground work done. You're not going to kill the chickens, are you? Ah, poor planning on my part. Should have started my truck earlier. Nice and frosty this morning. Stick around because I am going to show you guys something crazy that happened in the local area last week. You will not believe the scale of destruction that occurred at a local grain elevator. And I just happened to be going up that way with my semi later this morning. So maybe I'll stop and look at it. Before I start chit-chatting about updates here at the bin site at the main farm, I need to get my Hagee started because I'm running it up to Cy Hoppers at Planters Precision. He's the local precision planting expert. Most of you who are farmers know what precision planting is. It's an aftermarket parts company, and actually they even have OEM stuff now with a few companies, just not John Deere. Their name is a little misleading because they do offer more than just planting parts. And what we're interested in is a boom recirculation system for our 2021 Hagee. Actually, you know, it's a, I think it's a 2019, 2020, whatever. It's a two to three to four to five year old Hagee. That was very vague as well. As of a few weeks ago, she's got two new batteries in it, so I'll fire her right up. I'm gonna be a gentleman and let the Hagee warm up a tiny bit before we take it down the road. It's not very far to size, about six or seven miles. In a roundabout farming way, they're almost our neighbors because they're up the road. Your neighbors in today's farming world is not the same as 30, 40 years ago because there's not a farm on every section. It's a lot less farms, so the ones who get closer at arm's reach are the people I guess you'd call your neighbors. I wanted to let you know that York Bin Co. did stop by to this North Bean Bin that gave us all sorts of issues at the beginning of the year and according to them they have it fixed. We don't know for sure just because we're not hauling out of it. We moved the conveyor down started working on other bins and we'll get back to this when we get to it. Here is the original flighting out of this bin. I believe this is 8 inch flighting. You can see that it's starting to crack and wear and there's chips out of certain pieces and you get to the center sump side of the screw and it's not looking too hot it definitely was getting worn did it need replaced i don't know i mean you could argue about it all day it's kind of like my old man he's getting old and brittle he's got some battle wounds but you could still get a few more years out of it if he wants to keep working this was the main issue though in here where the center sweep auger thing attaches was worn off or broken off and it was one of those things where it just made more sense to go ahead and replace the whole flighting it was close enough to worn out that you really weren't wasting too much money i mean we probably could take this to a welding shop i don't exactly know because when you start to weld on these if it gets too hot it warps it i mean you're just creating a lot of issues sometimes it's easier just to get a brand new one they put the new one in and then they replace the part that attaches to the bin on the inside to drive the sweep auger like I said, I don't know entirely whether or not the sweep is working, though there was a huge pile of beans on the ground from them running it, so I guess it is. In other news, we spent the last week or two coring all of the bins here at the main farm. The bean bin is almost empty and it would be if the sweep wasn't broken. And we pulled enough loads to kind of increase the longevity of the bins. I'm not gonna talk about how that works right now. Basically, depending on the size of the bin, you pull more loads out, pulling that core down, which is the most subject to going off grid in the long term with corn. Probably not an issue when most of the corn is 13 to 15%. That's a relatively reasonable moisture percentage for storing long term. Small bin like this, 
two or three loads will core it. 36 foot bins, probably five loads to core each one. The 48 footers, because they're bigger, we try to pull about 10 loads. So these are all good to go, presumably to store for a while. And the reason we do that and not just empty everyone as we go is because we don't know what the future holds. We like to maintain the storability, if that's even a word of the bins, as opposed to just focusing on one specific bin. It's a better use of our time. And then we'll come back and reevaluate when we want to start actually emptying the bins. I'm long winded enough that the Hagee's probably getting close to warm. So we'll leave shortly. The nice thing about the new bin is the staircase that makes it super easy for me to actually climb up here with the camera and show you what's going on. The bins with the ladder are almost impossible for me to bring this big camera up because I need a backpack or something. You need two hands to climb a ladder on the bin. At least you need two hands if you care about your life. I just wanted to come up and visualize what coring looks like. Here's the new 48 footer. As you can presume, we had it filled all the way to the top. So there was a cone upwards. Coring it is just pulling the cone all the way down. If I understand correctly, you actually don't have to pull the cone all the way down. You just kind of want to get it level, but we go ahead and pull it down. We've never really had issues of corn bins going off grade. I don't think that's really a testament to our ability to store corn. Corn's just easy to keep in good condition. When Jeff and I are running both trucks out of these bins, we can load fast. If there's not a long line at the elevator, we can haul 10 to 12 loads a day pretty easy as long as there's no issues anywhere. So coring these is really not that much of a challenge. So we like to get it done when we can. If we just skipped our three hour lunch and our cigarette breaks every hour, we could probably actually get 15 to 16 loads a day, but we don't want to work too hard. It's job security. The top of my lengthy wish list is a shed that you pull into and out of. You don't back out of because it's very hard to see with some of this stuff, especially when you got a conveyor right here to your east. Yeah, just like riding a bike. A weird bike, but a bike nonetheless. Getting this thing out of the shed's got me all excited for planting and spraying season. I try to be eternally optimistic when it comes to these things. I'm thinking record yields, everything's gonna go great. I know historically there's a lot of yields where none of that happens. We have horrible planting seasons and poor yields. We've been lucky the last few years to have some easy seasons. Yields have been all over the place, mostly strong. I just know that Mother Nature finds a way to balance the scales out across the United States every once in a while. Who knows? Could be a hard year. We may have to wait to June to go to Arizona or Florida as opposed to just going mid-May. We got the Hagee up the road, dropped off at Size Place. They said they should have it done within a few days. It's not their first one, so don't think there'll be any major hiccups. It's not really a terribly complicated process. It's just not easy at the same time. A lot of plumbing work to get all of the boom ends back to the main tank with control valves and all that stuff. So Precision's got it handled, confident in their ability. Now onto our next project. I can't recall if I talked about it or not. Precision is installing their reclaim system. It's a aftermarket recirculating boom system for a sprayer that's not equipped with PWM nozzles. It's relatively simple. I'm sure I mentioned that. And it's just gonna help with efficacy of spray products, lack of crop damage when you start first thing from sediments and other contaminants in your boom from a counter crop chemical and that's the goal there is just to do a better job spraying it's a relatively minimal cost i'm thinking just over five figures so i think 11 12 13 thousand dollars for the install should help me do a better job for my family as i'm spraying and that's really my goal sometimes you just got to spray money or spray money spend money to do better work it's not a huge upgrade especially when you consider going the john deere route it's probably forty thousand dollars to do the same thing the old cat's using a little bit of oil i should throw some more in there before i take off with this i guess the start of today's video is all about spray stuff because I took the heggy up there to size and now i gotta go get my tanker that's been in the shop in our cola for the last two weeks getting a sparge tube system installed to help mix our chemicals better. You kind of see the picture here. Spend a little bit of money to help improve the performance of our farm. Don't know how much to add. Just gonna get some 15W40 somewhere. Is it even a caterpillar if it ain't burning a little bit of oil? Good part of life. Okay, we are 
are headed north to pick up our tanker. Speaking of this truck, I don't remember if I told you that they had to put a new alternator in it. That's what was giving me power issues a few weeks ago. I think I told you, but I'll remind you if you didn't know. Our cola is about 10-ish miles north of Mattoon, and our farm is about 7 or 8 miles southwest of Mattoon. So 20 miles is not exactly a straight shot, and we'll be where we need to go. Once you get north of Mattoon, this is God's country up here. You can see for miles high productivity soil. A lot of times the hardest part up here because there's not much change in elevation is draining farms. With some subsurface systems, you can have to go miles up here if there's not a local drainage district tile installed to find an outlet that will effectively move the water off of these farms. If you can drain these swamps up here though, it is quite literally the best ground in the world to grow corn and soybeans. It sells like it's the best ground too because this stuff's $18,000, $19,000, an acre plus right now. About two miles in the distance, you can see this monstrous grain facility straddling Route 45. It belongs to TGM who we do a lot of business with down south. It's our Arcola facility and some of you may be familiar with this facility based on what happened up here last week. Holy smokes, are those cranes? I see at least three cranes up in the air right now trying to repair the damage from a ginormous crane that collapsed up here. If I get a little closer, I'll try to find a spot to park and maybe be a little bit nosy. Between the normally dense traffic at this intersection, an added amount of possible spectators driving around checking out the carnage, and of course the intense efforts to clean up the corn and repair this massive commercial elevator, I opted to not get out of the truck and film. It just wasn't a good opportunity. I did snap a few pictures and I am going to commentate over some clips and footage. In this first picture, we are to the southeast of TGM and Arcola. You can see that this is a fairly large grain elevator. The leg or conveyor over the top is visibly bent, knocked over. The outloading bin, which is kind of adjacent to it on the left side is also destroyed or definitely compromised. So there's a lot of very visible damage to this from just the southeast angle. You can't really see the extent of the damage though because the broken bin is tucked behind this other massive bin on the left side of the image. If you do look kind of towards ground level, there is a lot of corn back there. And if you look really closely, you can see the GSI emblem on the side of the bin laying on the ground. The neighboring business to the south had a couple of security camera angles pointed directly this way, just happened to catch the destruction as it went down. Check this out. Can you imagine what that car's thinking right now? Look at that, bin buckles down below, and then about midway to two thirds of the way up, it just breaks. I'm not an engineer, so I'm not gonna begin to speculate about what went bad there, bad panel, missing bolts maybe, anchor bolts broke. Supposedly this was an 800,000 bushel bin, give or take a few bushels, only five or six years old. TGM did not build this bin because they bought the facility two or three years ago, so it was already built when they bought the facility. <laughs> that car, <laughs> he's probably like, what the heck? It is very fortunate because dust like that, if it is from the corn grain, if that is corn dust, a spark could cause a very quick and immense fire almost because that corn dust is flammable, although that could just be from the gravel getting pushed out. I would speculate that the scale house did get destroyed based on that angle. That's crazy. You might need to go back and watch that a time or two, folks. That was a lot of corn. It was a full 800,000 bushel bin. And here, folks, courtesy of some drone images from a local farmer, is a good overhead view of the aftermath. I want to start by saying the silver lining here is that not a single soul was hurt 
because of this incident. The neighboring houses do look like they took on some corn. I believe TGM did relocate them to a hotel or something just because of the inconvenience of the corn coming into their house. I mean, you wouldn't want corn encroaching into your garage and stuff. This incident occurred at 6.30, so if this had happened, you know, at three o'clock in the afternoon, someone could have been standing there and you would not have survived that. If you were under that bin and that corn fell on you, you are essentially dead. It really makes you think twice about being by some of these commercial bins of this size, and there's a lot of them at some of these elevators that we sit right next to in line. However, this is a one-off event. This type of grain bin destruction doesn't seem to happen very often. We can always begin to speculate about what might have caused it. It was full, corn is heavy, obviously a structural compromise of some type. Based on the video evidence, the bottom ring is actually what gave way first, and that weakness down below created the extrusion up top where the grain piled out of. These grain bins are very strong when they are completely attached together in unison. However, once they start to break, they become very weak. Usually full grain bins are more structurally sound from wind damage and tornadoes because of the corn inside. It looks like though, that if they're not structurally sound at a foundational level on the outside, that's nothing that's gonna keep that corn in. You're looking at 800,000 bushels on the ground that TGM has to clean up because 800,000 bushels, even with today's depressed grain prices is $3 million worth of corn. And a lot of that is not their corn because grain elevators cannot speculate on the price of corn. They can only speculate on basis, which is that small margin in between the futures price and the cash price. And that's where elevators make their money. So a lot of this money on the ground in a roundabout way is the farmers, but because it's on TGM's property, the farmers are not liable here. So they'll still continue to maintain their paper ownership of corn bushels if they have them. And TGM has to pick up the physical bushels at their facility. Here's an overhead angle. You can see that the bottom three or four rings of corn is still in the bin. I assume if the electrical works, they could still outload the bin. Normally once they got the top cleaned up, the neighbors definitely have some corn in their house, in their garage. It's just gonna be a long process for TGM to pick this up. I believe companies do exist that specialize in this kind of cleanup. All of this stuff that's picked up off the ground will need filtered because you get rocks in there. I mean, no end user wants a rock going through their system. They only want corn. They'll have to do a good job of getting all of that out. And just look at this bin. I mean, it's coiled over. I don't know if that other big bin is compromised. I would think that there's a good chance it might be based on the way this fell. They lost the overhead, they lost the conveyors. We're looking at just this bin alone. If it costs two to three dollars a bushel to build a commercial bin of this size, I don't know, let's say somewhere between two and a two and a half million dollars just for the bin. Concrete may be fine, so I don't know if they have to replace that. You've got, unless the concrete was the issue, and if insurance is paying for it all, you might go ahead and replace everything. I, I'm sure when this is all said and done between cleanup, new bins and stuff, there's no way that this facility is not gonna have a five plus million dollar bill to rebuild this bin. If they even do, I would think they would and get everything back to operating normally. I'll just go ahead and show a few more angles that this farmer drone pilot provided. Excellent photography, really. I just wanna emphasize how much corn 800,000 bushels is. We don't even grow 800,000 bushels on our entire farm in one year. This elevator has 800,000 bushels on the ground. I'd love to hear your conjecture and theories in the comments below or what you know about the situation. Obviously, we like working with TGM other than their long lines down in Nioga. You hate for them to have a facility go down like this, especially one that's probably pretty useful to farmers in the Arcola area. Although some of those guys are probably heading straight to Decatur anyways, they skipped the local elevator. That can't entirely be true considering that this facility is right next to the rail. What do you guys think happened? Bad anchor bolts, bad panels, temperature change because it was like negative 20 degrees outside and then came up to 60 within the same week, stretched the metal. Too much heavy corn in the bin, it wasn't built right. There's a million different reasons why this could have happened. 
Yeah, drop a comment below. At the end of the day, like I've said numerous times, we can be thankful that no one got hurt. Okay, enough sightseeing, time to pick up our tanker. I see it almost immediately, because I wrapped the engine up with a tarp to keep some of the moisture out of it. I'll come over this way, go inside and pay, and check out what we're looking at. We got our beloved tanker with some awesome upgrades. I'll show you what we did when we get back home. Happy to have it done. Bulk Tech in Arcola is where we had the work done. I think jobs like this is more of moonlighting for them. They're kind of low key here, but supposedly they have a fleet of over like 500 tankers. I think that's what I heard. And they lease them all out, they maintain them. So that's the bulk of their business is maintaining their own fleet. And then occasionally they work in a gracious customer like us to help improve our tanker. So glad they got us in this off season. We're ready to roll for spring. Man, you can see the cranes hoisted way in the air from the east side of town. Take one last look at the project before we head south. I don't envy those guys today, jeez. It's kind of comical the number of farmers you see driving by to check out the damage. There's guys from that too up in this area and I know they're here to see what's going on at the elevator. So here is our 7,000 gallon tanker we bought last year. It's a 1991 Brenner. It was a four compartment. Those of you who have followed along in the saga since we acquired this, we had the welding shop in Sigel cut it down to a two compartment tanker. They cut the bulkheads out in the middle of each intermediary compartment into baffles. So now we have two big compartments. We acquired this pretty close to planning season, had the work done on it. And by the time we were pulling it out of the welding shop, it was almost time to start spraying. Helena plumbed it up for us. They did a really good job, color coded everything. And to the best of their ability, they installed an agitation system on the front and the back. All they did was put this T out of the pump and run one line to the front into a valve going in and a pipe against the wall to stir a little bit. And they did the same on the back. That way we could select where we were agitating to. The problem with that is, is when this compartment is fully loaded, dumping it into the top does a lot on the top, but it really does not tickle down on the bottom. When we're spraying products that are likely to settle out, like your atrazines, that becomes an issue that you don't even really notice till the tanker is empty. And when you go to empty the tanker, or it's down at the bottom, you see a vat of latex looking paint stuff on the bottom, you know your atrazine was not getting mixed. And although it's not a huge issue, it is reducing the efficacy of your spray solution and just wasting product overall. So we had Bulk Tech install what is more of an advanced agitation system, just not standard on most tankers, and that is a sparge tube. You can see they actually did the plumbing for me. I was shocked. Out of Helena's T, here's the first sparge tube inlet. It does the first compartment, and then the other side is a separate one. It does the back compartment. The sparge tube is essentially this two inch stainless steel line that runs all the way front to back it has a hole about every 16 inches, I believe about the size of a penny. And the sparge tube holes are pointed down against the wall of the tanker. And when that pump is running into the tube, it pushes that product down in jet-like fashion against the tanker and rolls the whole load. Basically, this guarantees that the bottom, which is the most likely to settle out and place where chemicals will be, gets mixed up into the entirety of the load. This is a really big upgrade for us in terms of chemical quality out of our tanker. As I mentioned, we have one on the back end of the tanker and then one on the front end of the tanker, plumbed separately. Although most of the time we're carrying the same exact chemical load front and back, there are a few occasions where we might have a little mix of a trial product or something in one compartment. And it's really nice to be able to agitate them separately as well. On the front and the back of the tubes, there is a clean out cap. So if the holes get plugged up or I wanna run some clean water out, I take this cap out. It's about the only thing I'm not sure I agree with is putting a plastic cap on the end of a stainless steel system. You're just asking for trouble. I'm probably gonna order some two inch stainless threaded caps to put on here because if this does break, which it shouldn't, it's gonna empty your entire compartment of chemical on the ground, and that would be a nightmare. And that's pretty much what we had done. It doesn't sound very exciting, 
but I will show you the firepower of this mixing system once it warms up a little bit and I'm ready to dewinterize the tanker. For now though, I'm gonna leave my coolant in the pump because it may get cold again. I don't wanna screw with having to winterize it another time. We were getting ready to back this thing into the shed and then dad and I had a conversation about the tires. You know, should we go ahead and work on them if they need work? And I said, I noticed that one of our tires was getting some really nasty weather cracking around the outside or showing its age, which is surprising because the tread is phenomenal. I don't know how that happened. And so we are gonna go ahead and take this into Neil Tire shortly. Should have just done it on my way back through. It just wasn't a conversation dad and I had till I got back home. The guys at Neil Tire said that that will probably blow sooner rather than later especially when it gets warm outside. Tires. Oh. Get back. You're hitting the head with a bit of a drop cord. Dad and Jeff checked another bin site. It looks like it's gonna be close to firm enough to haul some corn and core a few other bins, so we're kind of moving that direction right now. Push! Stop pulling it in. So one of the two people working on that project bent the doors on that trailer a few weeks back working when it was frozen outside and based on the physical condition of our bodies there the person with two arms is probably the culprit although I may never admit to that dad helped me get it bent back into shape I thought we'd have to cut it off and just get new brackets but he's pretty crafty with a hammer and a cutting torch so figured it out it works fine just needs some paint one new tire on the tanker trailer later and we're bringing it back home and storing the shed for another six or eight weeks much to my surprise the sun actually feels warm today for the first time in months it is legitimately warm on my skin which isn't necessarily a good thing for someone who's prone to skin cancer at this young age Surprisingly, some of these farms are actually starting to gray off a little bit. Not all of them, the really wet ones are obviously still holding a lot of moisture. There are areas though where if it stayed like this for another seven days, if that, you could probably do some field work, which is unusual for February. Easy work's done. Now we gotta get this thing back in the shed somehow. took up way more space than I was expecting it to. 
I must have miscounted my steps when I walked it off or it's longer than I realized. I think it's a 40 foot trailer. The tanker's pretty much an afterthought until things start to pick up a little bit more in the spring. For now, we're hooked up and ready to haul grain if we get an opportunity to. Jeff's obviously working on that as we speak. We'll probably be joining him after we get a few more things checked off our to-do list. Anyways, that's gonna be it for this video. I'm taking it off, gonna go hang out with the family for a little bit. As always, I greatly appreciate every single one of you continuing to tune in and support the channel. Your viewership means the world to me. Catch you all in the next episode. Until then, make sure you like the video if you enjoyed it, subscribe if you wanna see more, and comment down below if you have any questions. You know I love to talk about farming. Have a great day, everyone. Peace!